All right, let's uh, get started. Um, so welcome to the special year seminar. Today we are pleased to have Professor Anand Saha give a talk. Uh, Anand is a professor at UC Berkeley and works on information theory, uh, decentralized control, and machine learning. Today he'll tell us about his insights on over parameterization. Thanks. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, okay, so uh, it's really nice to be able to give this uh, seminar. Uh, by Zoom, though it may be. It's my first time giving a talk by Zoom. The shelter in place I wasn't teaching uh, when, it, when it switched over. So, um, so first things I want to acknowledge that what I'm going to be talking about is work that's uh, with my students. Uh, and primarily, I think here, Vidya gets a lot of the credit. Uh, so she's just graduating now and is, you know, choosing between her faculty offers and things like that and uh, Vignesh and Adhyan and uh, Kailash as well. And the latter part of the work, when I, talk, when I start talking about uh, classification, this uh, was also uh, in collaboration with Misha Belkin and Daniel Su, and all of that collaboration started at the Simons program in the summer uh, on the foundations of deep learning. And so I'm gonna talk about work that's through a, a set of papers, but a lot of it, uh, is in this uh, paper that's going to come out in this inaugural issue of this new uh, information theory uh, journal on selected areas, which is focusing on the foundations of uh, deep learning in the first, uh, first, first special issue. Okay, so let me just get started. And uh, some of this is you know, known to most of you, but uh, you'll start with the basic you know, principle here. Uh, let's see here. You know, there is this great view uh, in science generally from Occam's razor that we prefer simple explanations. And I really like this quote uh, by John von Neumann, uh, which says, you know, with four parameters, I can fit an elephant and with five, I can get him to wiggle his trunk, which is really, you know, trying to capture the sense in which, you know, when there's too many parameters, you can't trust what comes out of your model. This is a kind of classical view in science. Now, from that perspective, we find ourselves in the modern world in which you know, we literally have you know, this like, circus of uh, really large models. And there was this very important paper you know, where we have this analysis that was done on looking at you know, CIFAR-10, which has 50,000 uh, training points and 60,000 points total. And they looked at these modern networks and they saw that these were in fact able to you know, interpolate everything. And, it were in fact so, had so much approximation ability that they could actually fit random labels. And yet when trained normally, they would still have you know, good test accuracy. So the question was, you know, what is going on? And what's happening in these interpolative models? And that's what I'm gonna be uh, talking about. Uh, I'm gonna take a simple perspective though. And we were inspired in part by this work and in part by you know, what we'd seen other people doing as they were trying to understand what was happening. So this, you know, of course, was not, is not, we're not the first people to think about this, is it? You know, we're joining a line of work. And we saw that people were looking at the problem and trying to understand it from an algorithmic perspective as well as a generalization perspective. And there's a lot of work. And it seems, uh, if I had to, you know, summarize it in perhaps overly simplified manner, uh, one theme sort of says that the overparameterization uh, helps us make the algorithmic problem easier. It lets us find global minima in an easier way. It's possible to have global minima, which interpolate all the points, and they're easier to find. On the generalization side, essentially people said, well, you know, this doesn't seem to be behaving according to you know, some kind of explicit regularization. In fact, we can turn the explicit regularization off, and it still works. So something here must be making this work. And you know, there's a lot of work looking at in what various senses does the process of training, and in particular the use of SGD, carry out a sense of implicit regularization that allows generalization to happen. So we're more in the second theme of the work, except we're not going to be looking at um, SGD per se. So this work, this line of work, then led people to look at many different things empirically, and this I think very nice paper by Belkin, Su, Ma, and Mandel that came out December of 2018 said when they looked at lots of different uh, examples in, in practice, trying things out, they seen that what was happening was that it's like there's two regimes. 
there's the classical regime, which is on this side, in which you experience the traditional bias variance trade-off that we're used to, which is that as you make your model more complex, your training risk goes down as you're able to better and better fit the training data. But what happens is that at some point you start uh, what's traditionally viewed as overfitting and your test performance gets worse. And so this, you know, traditionally has been used to argue and we all teach it in our classes that you, know, you should go for models that are as simple as possible so that while still doing well. But what they observed was that in many, many settings, what happens is that you can keep going, keep adding to the complexity of your model. And at some point you can interpolate the data perfectly. And if you go beyond that point, if you go to the, from the under-parameterized to the over-parameterized regime, the performance seems to be getting better. So we call this the double descent phenomena. And uh, at times it seems that as you keep going, it does even better than it would have done in the, in the classical regime. So this is something that you know, they looked at by looking at various examples, they tried it out, and we want to understand this better. So uh, moving forward, um, the way that this talk is gonna proceed is I'm gonna look, try to understand this from a very, very simple perspective. I'm gonna look at the simplest model in which I can try to see what's going on. And that's the simple linear regression model. And what I want to understand is first, if we ask ourselves to look for interpolative solutions, is there a price that we have to pay for interpolation? Is it the case that uh, interpolation can come for free? Um, if not, what is the price? And then we'll see that, of course, you know, that it turns out that if you add more and more parameters, this price will go down. And then we want to understand what is actually required to reap these benefits and interpolate well. And here, philosophically, I am um, motivated by something that uh, Bob Gallagher uh, once uh, uh, told me, and he said repeated in many, uh, many talks, which is that he said that the goal of research isn't always to grow the tree of knowledge, to add more branches and leaves. Sometimes the goal of research is to prune the tree of knowledge, to kind of go back from the outside and try to see what maybe the inner structure of things might be. So I'm going to try to try to get to some simplicity here. And I want to also recognize that this was this work was very much inspired by the need to teach. Uh, before I taught the machine learning class at Berkeley, I had a conversation with the people who taught it before me. And one of them was uh, Ben Recht. And this was just after you know, that paper had come out. And he was saying, you know, in a provocative way, you know, whether we should even teach bias variance trade-off anymore since many th things in practice seem to violate it. And it uh, kind of got me thinking as to, well, okay, how can we possibly teach this better and understand what's going on in a simple enough way? So this is like our attempts to move in that direction. Okay, so let's just start in. So I'm gonna talk about uh, linear regression. So let's review under-parameterized linear regression first. So you think about it, we're gonna have uh, uh, an underlying true parameter, which is alpha star, and there are going to be covariates X, and we have some features A, and the number of features we have is uh, D, and we're gonna think of the case where in under-parameterized linear regression, classic case, where you have more samples than you have features. So you have this tall matrix A, that comes from stacking all of these guys up, uh, and you want to figure out what this parameter is that you don't know. There's an underlying true one, but you don't know it. You only have these noisy observations. And so you basically solve a least squares problem. And here, what I'm interested in, when I, when I talk about test MSC here, I'm going to talk about what is the test mean squared error without this observation noise. So when I think the observation noise is this something that was corrupting our training data, we really would like to get at the underlying true thing which is uh, for regression is just the features times the uh, true parameter. So this is what I'm gonna uh, view as my uh, test MSC. So we can think about this and you know, we have this classical picture with you know, printing polynomials. So here's N equals nine noisy samples, these black dots uh, from a one degree polynomial, which is here. And you know, if we fit a one degree polynomial to this, it's actually pretty good, it, just, it hits it exactly. But if we ask for a degree eight fit, the interpolating fit, it's pretty bad. 
it's you know obviously generalizing quite poorly. This is you know just bring everyone to the same page. This is what's kind of motivating everyone's view of this uh, classical bias variance trade-off. That you know interpolating is a bad idea here. So now let's move to the thing that we want to study, which is the interpolative regime to get over-parameterized linear regression. So everything will stay exactly the same. What's changed is that now we're going to have more features than we have samples. So instead of having a tall matrix, we're going to have a wide matrix A. And now we'd like to still estimate uh, this parameter uh, uh, alpha. And the issue is that if we just set up the equation A alpha equals Y, this has infinitely many interpolative solutions you know, because D is greater than N. We're still interested in minimizing this uh, test mean squared error. And so what can happen? So here I'm going to draw uh, some pictures to show you how maybe you can, it's not surprising that you could do better. So the red curve above says, instead of asking for a degree eight fit or degree one fit for this line, let's ask for a degree 40 fit. So there's only nine samples. Let's ask for a degree 40 fit. If you do it in the straightforward way, if you try to code it up, the degree 40 fit you're going to get will be this uh, red, red curve. I didn't sample it enough, but uh, it's this uh, red curve. And it's pretty harmful. It's worse than the degree 8. So if you see this picture, you're like, well, OK, why would I ever want to go to the overparameterized regime? It just makes things worse. But it turns out that there's infinitely many uh, degree 40 fits uh, to these nine points. And so we can actually go searching for what's the best a degree 40 fit that you know, has the least error, and uh, at least test error. And if you look for that, you get this uh, curve. And you can see this is less harmful as an interpolator than the green one, which is the degree 8 fit. Now, in a sense, this is obvious. You know? I, the, the degree 8 is a possible degree 40. Uh, you know, when I say degree 40, I mean degree at most 40. So we have more flexibility. We can only do better. And you know, it's not surprising that we do do better. So we want to understand you know, how harmless can interpolation be? And that's our goal. You know, can we do even better? This is, turns out to be the best in this case, but you know, is that, you know, can we understand how this thing behaves and how it scales as we increase the number of uh, features? So that brings me to the outline of the talk. So the first thing I'm going to talk about after this uh, introduction is uh, a converse. Oops where I want to give a lower bound that says, how, what is the fundamental price of interpolation? And then we're going to try to get some intuition from there. Having gotten that intuition, I'll talk about the question of, can we actually achieve these promised gains from interpolation? So is it possible, given a linear regression problem like this, to actually find these good solutions when, the, when there's a non-trivial uh, true parameter? And here, I'm going to talk about it in two steps. First, I'm going to talk about the thing that is most natural to think about, which is minimizing the two norm. So I want to find the minimum two norm interpolator. And here, I'm going to talk about some things that are known from a classical signal processing perspective, and I'll, uh, some challenges that we have to overcome, as well as what's required to be able to have it work. Having talked about what happens with the minimum two norm and then you know, minimum weighted two norm, I'll talk about uh, the case of sparsity and L1 norm and things like that. Having talked about regression in this way, I'll then move into classification and see what's similar and what's different. And that's, that's what I would like to do today. So let's start in with the lower bound. You know, what is the fundamental price of interpolation? So if we look at this, we have this problem where I'm going to have output y and I have some underlying true parameter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to make the assumption that my features that I have are orthonormal. Now, what do I mean by orthonormal? What I mean is that these features, when I look at them as random variables and where the randomness comes from the test distribution, that different features are going to have uh, an, an expectation, an expected correlation of zero. Yeah, that's what I mean by orthonormal features. Now, I can always orthonormalize a feature family. Given some feature family, I can always, if I know the test distribution, I can always orthonormalize it. So from the point of view of getting a fundamental price, this is just a convenient thing to do for uh, 
insight. So why is it that orthonormalizing these features gives us some insight? Because it tells us that what we're really looking for to minimize the test mean squared error is I would like to find an estimate of the parameter such that the two norm squared difference between the parameter I find and the true parameter is minimized. Because by the orthonormality of the features, this is what the test MAC turns out to be. Having said that, we can now just proceed. We can say that um, the ideal interpolator is that interpolator that would minimize this quantity subject to the constraint of being an interpolator. It has to actually interpolate all of the noisy uh, training points. So for this bound, I'm going to assume that I have uh, a genie gives me access to the true parameter alpha star. Now, just because the genie told me the true parameter alpha star, alpha star isn't an interpolator. The price of interpolation is basically how close can I get to alpha star while still being an interpolator. So the great thing about this is that at this point, this is an exercise in basic linear algebra, and you can just write out the answer. You know, you know how to find the minimum uh, uh, two norm of this thing. You recenter, change variables to be centered on alpha star. In that case, you just want to find the minimum two norm interpolator of just the noise. And that's given by the more penrose pseudo inverse. And then you can compute what the induced uh, error must be. What I've done here is I've plotted it for the case of polynomial fits to 10 samples. And you can see that there is this converse as you increase the number of features, uh, the degree of the polynomial, it just keeps dropping. And in fact, it drops uh, as you increase the number of features, asymptotically, it drops like n over d. So the best mean squared error for the best interpolator drops as one over the number of features. So this way we have a, we can have a bound, it's easy to get, and it tells us that it doesn't, it doesn't matter what algorithm we use, how we actually find the uh, alpha that we're looking for. Whatever it is, it can't do better than this now. Okay, there's an interesting fact here that I just wanna point out is it's an interesting thing that the pseudo inverse doesn't depend on the labels, the y's. You pick this mapping from the labels to the parameter without ever looking at the labels, which is kind of interesting. So now I want to you know, give you some visualizations of what does ideal interpolation of noise looks like and why is it that as you increase the number of uh, features, it gets better and better. So to visualize this, I'm gonna take an idea that's standard in uh, signal processing, which is if you wanna look at a particular map, one thing you can look at, especially if the map is linear, is you can look at its impulse response. What happens when you hit it with a standard basis vector, you know, something that has a one in one position and zeros everywhere else. So here I'm gonna think about the case where I have nine samples of which uh, eight of them are pure zero, they're nothing at all, and a single point is perturbed uh, to one. And let's see what the best interpolation of this is. So, Let's look at orthonormal uh, feature families. So here's a couple of examples. I can use Legendre polynomials, which are orthonormal, um, between minus one and one. I can also look at the standard Fourier, sines and cosines. And for both of them, if I have nine features, I can interpolate these zeros, which are plotted at 10 to the minus 10 just for visualization, um, and this one, and I'll get these curves. And you can see that these are pretty bad. Um, the true thing is a zero, but one thing is we moved to one. And the average energy that's present in these, uh, uh, in these features and the average energy that's present in this uh, reconstructed signal you know, is div given by these dashed lines. So it's pretty high. So even though our training data for the Legendre polynomials consisted of all zeros and one one, the, the mean squared error for a test point is the square of 10 to the two something. So it's like 10 to the four, so it's quite bad. But now let's over-parameterize, let's add more features. So as I add more, we've got 36 features, you notice everything is becoming much more better behaved. It's all coming down. And as I go to more features, 201 features, everything comes down even further. So what's happening here 
is that we're getting the benefit of something that's called Parseval's relation in signal processing, which is that because I have an orthonormal feature family, the energy in the function is the same as the energy in the, these weights. It's the two are equivalent. So if I want to do well on test points, so the truth, the truth state here is a zero, then I would like to have the signal be as close to zero as possible, the reconstructed signal be as close to zero as possible. And that is done by making all these weights as small as possible. By giving it more flexibility, it's, a lot, it's able to make these weights smaller. And it turns out this also tells you why you're gonna have the scaling that you do. Namely that as you increase the number of features, the mean squared error drops you know, like one over D. So this, this insight here is kind of coming from a Fourier theoretic point of view. Right? It's kind of, this is related to traditional ideas of you know, Fourier transforms and uh, looking at sampling in Fourier transforms. So the question is, is this paradigmatic? So what I've done here is I've plotted that same converse. Again, everything on this side of this dashed line is the classical regime of uh, ordinary least squares. And everything on this side is the interpolating regime. And I'm plotting the converse, I mean, the best that mean squared error could possibly be. And here is the case of Legendre polynomials, which is an orthonormal family of, of a polynomial. So it tells you how well can polynomial fits do. And here I just do n equals 15. So if you look at the noise level here, the, the noise that we have in our training data, it's just set at 10 to the minus 4. And this is what it looks like. So it's, you know, it's horrible, but it gets better. And I plotted it on a log log scale. So you can see the linear behavior here, this d over n, which is uh, going to look linear on a log log scale. So the question is, is the Fourier insight paradigmatic? Does it tell us what's happening for this case of polynomials? So let's plot the Fourier case. So by Fourier, I mean, what if you had regularly spaced samples and you're looking at Fourier features? And so that's this green curve. So the first thing you notice when you look at the green curve and the blue curve is that these curves are very, very different. So you know, because of the properties of the discrete Fourier transform, when you look at the exact interpolating case, when you have exactly 15 uh, Fourier features, you're just gonna get a, a matrix that's nice and you know, uh, unitary, and it's just gonna have exactly map the noise energy into the feature energy, and you know, you'll just get 10 to the minus four. Meanwhile, these uh, Legendre polynomials are up at you know, 10, to the 10 to the seven and things like that for n equals 15. So it's quite bad in this case. So it's not paradigmatic at all in the case of you know, barely overparameterized. But when you get to the very overparameterized case, the 10x overparameterization, then you see that it's actually pretty close. And in fact, you can try Gaussian features. So what do I mean by Gaussian features? So you pretend that all of my features are IID Gaussians. Um, there, again, you see the same kind of behavior. The, as you get to the highly overparameterized regime, it's behaving like the Fourier case. And this is that n over d scaling that uh, I was talking about earlier. And in fact, you can throw in other uh, families and you get the same thing. So any questions on this? I see. Yeah. Can yeah. I ask a question? So in this graph, you're graphing the test mean squared error for the smallest error guy in that parameter space. Yes. And not the smallest training error, but you're graphing the guy who has the smallest test error. Yes. So this is the guy on this side. This is the interpolative side. So I'm framing the, uh, where, where the converse is. I just put the least square side here for classical comparison. So on this side, I'm, I'm plotting the least uh, test error possible. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And in particular, you're not, you're not plotting the pseudo inverse solution on the right hand side. So the right hand side is, uh, it turns out it's, it is the pseudo inverse solution if the true signal was just zero. But because it's a converse, the true thing could have been anything. The true polynomial could have been any polynomial um, uh, that, was with it, that was expressible, and this would still be the converse for how well you could do. But you could also compute that by looking at exactly how the pseudo inverse behaves for 
zero and just the uh, training noise. And, and your training data is everything is zero except like three of the points are. Oh, so here. Minus four. Um, I, I use that for, to illustrate what was happening, but this is actually for the case where every uh, training point has I the uh, Gaussian noise with variance 10 to the minus four. One. Oh, I see. So you don't add the noise separately. Yeah, the noise is on the training points. And so um, when I talk about the test mean squared error, I'm looking at the part where you, using conventional machine learning language, we subtract away the irreducible error. Like, I'm not interested in seeing these curves shifted up to 10 to the minus 4, which is the noise. I want to look at, you know, how well can I do on the underlying true thing, which is just the feature times uh, the true parameter. So what this is illustrating is that, you know, regardless of these feature families, you do get the scaling that, uh, you know, we get, we, we predict from the Fourier case. And everything in the highly overparameter regime seems to behave like this. Okay, so I'll uh, keep moving. So why is this happening and can we get an intuition for it? I'm going to give you two different intuitions. One that's coming from a Fourier theoretic uh, perspective and the other that's going to come from a random matrix, uh, more traditional point of view. Um, oops. So what is going on? So from a signal processing point of view, there's a very important concept, which is called aliasing. And uh, what, are, what are aliases? So this is a very useful concept. Uh, when you have samples, two signals are aliases if they happen to agree on the sample points. So looking at the sample points, you can't tell them apart. So the classic thing that's used here to illustrate aliasing uh, in signal processing courses, for example, is you take a, a fan, take a picture, like a movie of a fan, and you know, the fan is moving around this way, and then you put a strobe light, which is like taking samples of the fan. And you see that you know, the fan is moving you know, at some speed, but if you have adjust the strobe light to something, the fan will you know, stop, or go backwards or go forwards. What that means is that all of those motions, when subject to the sampling at the strobe light frequency, they all look alike. And so those are aliases of each other. So this is a general phenomenon. There are many, many, many different patterns that would agree on the sample points. And in this particular case, what I'm illustrating is you have a low frequency cosine and these four points were sampled from the low frequency cosine. But this low frequency cosine at these four points is also aliased by this green curve. And this green curve is, is just a bunch of higher frequency things that have been added up that also happen to agree at these four points. The green curve, the dark green curve, can, is, sum, is a sum of a bunch of these uh, little light green curves. I just want to illustrate all these little sinusoids adding up to give you this, this curve. Now, from the point of view of a, an inference algorithm that has to represent what signal has to guess, what is the underlying signal that give, gave rise to these four points? Um, and it has the choice of this huge family of sinusoids that it can use to add up. No, there's nothing telling it it has to pick this one. It could just as well pick you know, the green curve. Both of them agree. And if you notice here, the green curve actually spends a lot more time hanging around zero. So a minimum two norm solution would actually prefer the green curve. Um, even if you, it really depends on what, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, depends on what you want. If you think that the underlying thing should be low frequency, then the fact that it's reconstructed this uh, dark green curve is a bad thing. But if you think that these four points were just noise, then the fact that it's reconstructed this green curve is a good thing because it's making smaller predictions everywhere else as a result. So this issue of aliasing is fundamental to when you're trying to learn uh, in an overparameterized setting. Um, there's gonna be many, many things that represent the data and there's going to be different ones that agree on the sample points. And any inference algorithm is going to figure out, has to somehow balance between them. So in this case, with this underlying phenomenon in mind, why do you get the N over D scaling? 
So here's the intuition for what's going on. There's D possible there's D features. All of them are orthonormal. So you have N data points. So there's roughly for any N subset of these orthogonal orthonormal features, you can find a fit to those N points because N generically N equations N unknowns, you're gonna have a solution. So you can think of it intuitively that there's D over N mutually orthogonal aliases for the noise. These are all these D over N different things, all orthogonal to each other, and they all fit the noise perfectly. Let's just pretend that all of these aliases has an average energy of C sigma squared. Now in reality, they're gonna be different, but this is like just to give you the intuition. Now, if I have these different aliases and they all fit the training data perfectly, you can think of it this way, or the, you know, in this case, just the noise, the noise perfectly. I can come up with another alias that also fits them perfectly, namely the average of all of them. But usually when you take the average of many such things, you will get a reduction in the overall energy. Um, this is like, you know, like one over N, uh, N times has an average energy of one over N squared summed up, which is one over N rather than one zero zero zero, which has an average energy of one. So it's, you know, averaging helps and it causes the, the energy to decay like N over D. This is why you're getting from an intuitive point of view, why adding more and more uh, features allows the noise to be absorbed in a way that has less impact on the test error, namely as N over D in principle. So this intuition is exactly correct for regular samples with Fourier features, right? Because there's no issue of, you know, this, this is exactly how things behave. And it turns out it also behaves reasonably well when you have a generic situation when you have lots and lots of features. So why is that happening? So here we can take a kind of a different perspective, a matrix perspective. So let's think of it this way. So this is like, um, you have a wide matrix, A. It's filled with random, some kind of random features. You would like to see how does, you know, how does, how does things behave as you make this matrix wider and wider and wider and why things will uh, decay like N over D as you make it wider and wider. And so when you look at this question, of course you have to do the analysis fresh and we do it in the paper, but how do you get an intuition? To get an intuition, you can say, hmm, clearly this is gonna have something to do with the you know, conditioning of this matrix. And I actually know how a problem like this would behave if it wasn't a wide matrix. If it was a tall matrix, if I had lots and lots of features uh, and had lots and lots of samples and I was increasing the number of samples, I know exactly what's going to happen. As I add more and more samples, my error is going to decay like D over N. Right? This is a you know, classic thing that we all know for these squares. So what's going on? What's happening here is that the intuition can be made more precise that the min and max singular values of a matrix don't really care if the matrix is tall or wide. In fact, all the singular values, they don't really care if the matrix is tall or wide. And for conditioning purposes, more features are like more data. And so you get the same kind of scaling behavior. Um, it's N over D for the case of getting wider just because uh, you know, D, the number of features is what's growing. It's D over N for the usual case where you have a small number of features and you add more samples. So this turns out as an intuition can be turned into a, a proof. It's using very standard techniques. And you say, well, for the analysis of the pseudo inverse, you have, you know, you look at the induced error, it looks like this. And then you can just go through a set of very standard things to see that what you get is an N over D scaling um, in this. So this is how you can show that this converse behavior is what can happen. This is the best case that uh, interpolated solutions can do. 
So, so far, I've just talked about why it's in principle possible to find interpolative solutions that have better and better performance as you increase the number of features. However, there's still the issue of actually being able to find them. You know, like, is there an algorithm that can find them and find them for the case that's not zero? And so that's what I'm going to talk about next. And what I'm going to start with is I'm going to start with talking about the most natural thing to do, which is to use something like that pseudo inverse idea to just find the minimum two norm solution. Now, why do we care about minimum two norms? We care about minimum two norms because, you know, well, one is they're easy to analyze, but the other thing is that we have lots of results uh, and intuition that how SGD and gradient descent type approaches will uh, kind of are intrinsically regularizing themselves sometimes to find the minimum distance from their initial point that is going to work. That's like the minimum two norm distance. So it's natural to think about if you want to understand how things are working in SGD and using modern approaches, you know, understanding minimum two norm is important. So let's just see what happens if we try the minimum two norm interpolation. So again, I'm going to look at, remember the model, my output, my training data is just A times the underlying true parameter. There's some noise in all my training data. And when I say I want to find the minimum two norm interpolator solution, I'm ask, asking to analyze what is the behavior of this particular uh, inference approach, which is find the minimum two norm uh, solution. This is given by the more penrose pseudo inverse. So to see what happens, let's look at the case of where this matrix A is just filled with IID Gaussians. And this true parameter, suppose, was has 500 non-zero entries in it, and the rest of the entries are zero. So there's 500 true features that matter. The rest of the features don't matter at all. All the features are IID Gaussian. So here, you know, we can plot our converse. Our converse would say that as you add more and more features, this is for the case of 5,000 uh, training points, as you add more and more features, you're gonna, you know, do bad, and then going to do uh, better and better in principle. This is what's possible for the best possible uh, interpolating solution. But when you look at the minimum two norm interpolator, this is what it actually does. It, when, it, when it has only one choice, it's that thing. It gets better, but not that much better. In fact, the minimum two norm interpolator for this problem ends up going to the behavior of the zero fit. It basically, it behaves as well from a testing point of view as though you had just set your entire parameter estimate to zero. Now zero isn't an interpolator, so this is an interpolator, but it behaves very, very poorly. Uh, so this kind of uh, behavior is something that we can illustrate. So here I've, I've plotted a particular illustration uh, for this case. So over here are the true signal. This is where the true parameter lies. The orange is what the minimum two norm interpolator uh, estimates for them. And I'm just going to increase the number of uh, dimensions, number of features that I have to work with. So what you see is that as I add more and more of these dimensions, this true signal sort of bleeds away. So we call this signal bleed. And you get a whole bunch of these other features that are falsely discovered. So this is something which is well understood uh, as a phenomenon in you know, the signal processing literature when people think about sparse recovery. It's why sparse recovery is a thing. It's why people you know, have a study the, how you have estimators that can work in sparse cases. And the same observation, I want to give credit uh, here, is also uh, related to ideas in uh, the sequence of the series of papers uh, by different authors, Hesti, Montanari, Rossett, and Tipshirani, um, Bartlett, Long, Lugosi, and Sigler, and Belkin, Su, and, and Zhu, um, that all came around out, you know, last year, um, basically a year ago. Um, and all of the, and in particular, the uh, Hesti, Montanari, Rossett, and Tipshirani paper points out, uh, calls this thing the null risk, and says that 
what happens with the two norm interpolators that approaches the null risk um, in these cases. So this is what's happening, and this is basically bad behavior. This is not what you want. This is not nice double descent. It's, it's descent, yes, but it doesn't go to anywhere interesting. So this leads to this, the question of, OK, can anything be done about this? Can this ever work? And if so, what does it need to work? Yeah, is there a question? I was going to ask um, uh, what the connection with these ideas of bleed is, the work of Bartlett. OK, so the, uh, so you know, Peter's, Peter's right here um, at Berkeley. So um, we've had uh, you know, uh, conversations with uh, Peter. And I'll make this clear in a, in a bit. OK, so your, the Bartlett paper, uh, just to preview it a little bit, it talks about there's a condition that's needed, which he calls these effective ranks. Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Is that the paper? Yes. Yeah. And I'll, I'll make a connection in a bit to what that, what that is. So just hold on. Um, there's a very uh, important connection. And in fact, our work on interpreting this was inspired to a large extent um, by our conversations with Peter and trying to put our signal processing perspective and that paper kind of into a common ground of understanding. Okay, so uh, I'll talk about that in, in a bit. I guess, I mean, I'll just mention now, I mean, my, my, I understand that they have, so they're studying excess risk, which is what you're studying here, and they have yeah. lower, lower bounds in terms of their effective dimensions. And so it would seem, if, if I understand their work correctly, if this is how the L2, well, uh, uh, yeah, that for L2 to work, you, you really need these effective dimensions to be well behaved. Yes, and so I'm going to talk. Uh, well, that's exactly the point I'm going to get to about, about uh, trying to give a little bit of more interpretation of what those effective dimensions mean. I'm trying to be, so what you'll see is I'm, I'm going to try to give you a caricature that will let you see more intuitively what those effective dimensions are. Okay, so okay, so let's yeah, for, uh, why what it takes to make this thing work. So. To do that, to give that kind of um, intuition, I'm going to make the following caricature view that will help us understand. So I'm gonna say that I'm gonna look at the problem in the following kind of analogy. We understand things in the case of Fourier features very, very well. This is a classic subject, has been studied for you know, more than a century. And I'm gonna view the training points that I have for a machine learning problem, this linear regression problem, I'm going to view them as the sample domain and n, the number of training points, as being like the sampling rate in a traditional understanding of the sampling of a continuous time Fourier uh, signal. I'm going to think of the true pattern, the underlying pattern that underlies the data, as being like the underlying continuous signal in the traditional Fourier view of sampling of a continuous signal. I'm going to think of the learned feature weights as being the transform domain. So if you think about a Fourier transform, it says I have a continuous signal. I'm going to represent the transform domain as the sum of these sinusoids. And the transform is the weights on those sinusoids. So that's the analogy I'm using. And I'm going to look at the param overparameterization or the number of features d as being like the bandwidth that i'm using that i'm assuming the continuous time signal has for my reconstruction so what happens is overparameterization here becomes undersampling now why is this kind of reasonable to do because you know what i like about the fourier features is their nice orthonormality and for any generic uh, feature family that you're trying to learn in, there's going to be uh, a trans an orthogonal transformation that takes us meet to or orthogonal features, and it's just a matter of scaling, and the spectral theorem basically hands us these transforms. And uh, in, uh, this is called out very, very clearly in, for example, uh, uh, Peter's paper. Now, there's a couple of things here which I'm, in the interest of time, not going to dwell on. I would want to take the second one. Is there's this 
a thing that's done in signal processing, which is called some of wide sense stationary second order perspective of looking at uh, signals. What does that mean? It basically means I'm going to take a perspective on the sums of uncorrelated random variables. Uh, and then I'll use the independent case as a kind of way of understanding what happens. So this will become clear in a minute and will help understand what those, what's going on with those effective ranks. So here's the question. This behavior you're seeing here is very bad. Signals bleeding away. What does it take to stop it? And there's a basic answer. If you want to stop your inference algorithm from putting weight where it shouldn't and to put it where you want it to, the classical thing to do is you put a strong enough prior on where you want it to put weights. Right? If you put a strong enough prior that favors a true signal, you can get it to put the weights where you want it to. It's a very basic thing. We all know that. So how does that play out here? So I want to show some pictures. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to consider a case where uh, this is for the case of Fourier is what I'm drawing, illustrating here for you, is I'm going to look at uh, 500 uh, data points. I'm going to think of that I'm over-parameterized. I have 11,000 uh, possible uh, you know, Fourier coefficients. And I'm going to say that my true signal is just uh, you know, plus one on this side of uh, zero and minus one on this side of zero. So it's a very simple signal. And I would like to, I have training, I have data points, I have 500 data points kind of strewn about here. And I would like to learn it. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a prior. I'm gonna say that um, when, you, when the minimum two norm gets to use features, it gets a discount on features that are low frequency features. So the features over here are low frequency features. And in this particular case, they cost 100th of what the higher frequency features cost. So from a two norm perspective, they're attractive. If you can use them to fit, you should use them to fit. If you do that, what happens is that for this particular uh, signal, you do pretty well. You, you interpolate, you hit every single point, um, and you learn this green curve. And the green curve, from a mean squared error point of view, is pretty good. It says a mean squared error of 0.055. This is on clean data. The true pattern is this. There's no noise. Now let me add some noise. Okay? What I've done is I've put uh, basically you know, things that have a variance of you know, like 0.1. Uh, point two, you know, on, on top of this. And so now I have all these noisy points here and noisy points here. And I ask the, you know, this thing to fit it with the following weight. So all the low frequencies are discounted and it fits them all perfectly and basically gets a loss that's essentially unchanged from before. So all of that noise energy gets absorbed and it gets absorbed across these higher frequencies while the true signal gets preserved perfectly, or essentially perfectly. Sorry. Now, yeah. How is this different from just fitting with Fourier features, but only the first whatever 15? Excellent. So in this case, it's very, it's very close to fitting. In this case, it's just 20. It's 20 that I, I've selected here. Um, it's, it's almost like fitting with the first 20. That's what you, this is what you would have gotten if you just fit with the first 20. It would be visually indistinguishable. But if you tried to fit the noisy data with the first 20, you'd get something which would be basically like this again, but it wouldn't interpolate all the data. This interpolates all the data. All 500 data points are interpolated perfectly. Um, and it basically is like you were just fitting with the first 20, even but though you're actually interpolating. Like for the purposes of deep learning, what does it matter if you're actually interpolating the training data or not? Like that's an excellent question. And um, right now, everything I'm talking about is, is trying to focus on the case of I'm constraining myself to interpolate. I will hopefully get back to that question at the end of, you know, is this interpolation thing really that important or not? Okay, but right now I want to just view it as I want to understand whether I can interpolate. And the answer here is I can effectively 
this is effectively like fitting this with the first 20, except I'm not. <laughs> but what's interesting here is as I change the strength of this prior, if I make this prior um, not this strong, so I don't give a you know, 100 times discount to the early features, and instead only give a 10 fold discount to the early features, the behavior changes. So you look here and what hap what's happening is you're still interpolating all of the points perfectly, but the signal you've learned is, not, is no longer, you know, minus, basically hanging around minus one and plus one. It it's looks different. And my mean squared error loss against you know, minus one and plus one is actually getting larger. If I make the prior even weaker, you know, I basically give only a factor of two uh, discount to the early features, then it's, it's much, much worse. And so it really does matter how much you weigh in favor of where you think the signal should be. And you, it really does matter how much, the, how much you have a prior weight. And so, What's happening in Bartlett's effective ranks is related to this. It's how much are you weighting in favor of a certain subspace of features. So I use this language of bleeding. So what's happening here is that your true signal is bleeding away into higher frequency aliases. And so a way to think about this is the idea of like, where is this blood going? So here's this truth, is a caricature. Here's a true signal. Your inference algorithm doesn't recover it perfectly. It recovers a version of it. So it's been bled something. So this is like shrinkage. It's shrunk because of this bleeding effect. And all the training points are being interpolated. And they're being interpolated because of not just from the true signal, but because of some of these aliases are also doing some of the interpolative work. So this is, we can view as the spilled blood. So this is the signals being bled. The spilled blood kind of goes over here into orthogonal features. And all of these are signal aliases that effectively contaminate your predictions. Your predictions, all of these show up as adding variance to your predictions. Except what's interesting here is that it's, it's you think of this as being like a traditional view of bias, shrinkage bias. This is also a kind of bias, but it behaves like variance, right? It's like it's adding a prediction error, but it scales with the signal strength itself, not with noise. So this, there's two issues here, and we have to understand how they work, and this is what the effect, two different effective ranks in uh, Bartlett are really about. So uh, this is the picture, the shrinkage. So I want to just draw everything out. So here's this from previous slides. So here you have the uh, issue that this sh signal has been shrunk because we have all these false features being discovered. All of these things are causing contamination. You would like to have your signal survive. Your regression error, what's it like? So in a normalized sense, if, I, if my entire signal survived and there was no contamination, my regression error would be zero. So I want the survival to be as close to one as possible, and I would like the contamination to be going to zero. That's what I would need to have my regression error to go to zero. So by survival, I mean is suppose you only had the first feature being there. It's how much is the first feature surviving? So what is the estimate over the true? And the contamination is how much energy are you putting into the rest of the features. And here I'm normalizing it to have it have the same units as survival. So if you look at it this way, what we're saying is that when you put a strong prior, you basically downweight these guys and you don't let energy go there and you keep energy here. So it's almost like saying you only want to use the first few, except you also allow these to be used, just use them more sparingly from the point of view of the inference. So, this is what's needed to have uh, over-parameterization in L2 work. Now, what happens here is that you can think of it as, this is my, so these are the weights. This is how much I'm giving uh, the, a discount effectively to choosing these. This can be viewed as if my true signal had a feature that was in any of these different positions, how much would it survive? 
and how much would it give rise to contamination? So of course, if your true signal is what, where you're favored, it tends to survive. If your true signal happened to be something that your uh, inference algorithm did not favor, it would not survive and it would give rise instead to more contamination. So these two terms, the survival and the contamination, this is literally what the two effective ranks in Bartlett are about. Now, um, as you adjust the strength of this prior, as I was showing before, what's happening is that you're, when, this, when it's not so strong, when it's medium length, is that you get more uh, bleeding, which means less survival, and the contamination also increases. If you go to the weak prior, what happens is that your signal is bled a lot and there's a lot of contamination. Okay, so I wanna skip this in the interest of time because I want to get, make sure I can get to this very important point. So, so far, I've talked about this as though, uh, in the Fourier example, as our algorithm already knows in advance for L2 minimization where it would like to find the signal, right? So it says, I want to favor the low frequencies. In advance, I choose to favor the low frequencies. And that's what's needed to make it work. Now, what's interesting, and this is like a, a perspective on the, uh, also on the Bartlett paper and on other papers, the question is, who needs to know a prior? Okay, like who needs to know a prior? And this is not, this might seem like a philosophical question, but it turns out to be interesting here. In that, uh, from the point of view of a minimum two norm type of solution, it turns out that your algorithm doesn't need to necessarily know that prior if the covariates know the prior. So what I mean by the covariance of the prior. So from the point of view of the, for example, if you look at the Bartlett et al. paper, you can view the covariance structure itself as having a covariance matrix. And in that covariance matrix, there are, uh, it doesn't have to be orthonormal. Like I use orthonormal, orthonormal to illustrate everything because orthonormal features lets us focus on the natural geometry. But if the features show up to us, if the covariates show up to us in a certain way, they need not be orthonormal. In fact, they could be very far from orthonormal. It could be that they have a covariance structure which has certain subspaces that are far more represented than others, you know, in the sense of having much higher singular values. And in that way, the covariates themselves could actually know the prior. So here's an example of this. We can think of that as kind of an approximate sparsity. Um, that's implicit in the data itself. So here's an example that we kind of distilled down to, we think is the simplest possible example to illustrate this idea. Suppose my true signal was the simplest possible true signal, the constant one. Okay, the true signal is the constant one. And suppose all of my features were like Gaussian features, except they were all one plus a small Gaussian. So if you think about this particular case, as I give myself more and more features, all of which are essentially noisy constants, I can make a better and better approximation of the true feature, which is a constant. And I can learn it better and better. And so this is an example where, where we've done, we call them, um, the kind of name we have for these is like, they're kind of wiggly features. The features are, you know, wiggling around something else. You can also think of this as being, there's an underlying subspace of true features, and what you observe are projections, uh, no noisy projections from that uh, underlying uh, latent set. And if you look at that, what you get is, in this case, we had like, uh, you know, 10, uh, 10 points. <laughs> uh, as you add more and more features, the mean squared error gets better and better. And the reason is, is that the data itself, the covariates have a prior that's implicit. And L2 minimization can work in this case. So L2 style minimization can work if somehow your feature family has already a covariance structure 
that favors a particular much lower dimensional set. So with this idea of where L2 minimization things can work, but basically putting enough of a bias towards uh, a low frequency, uh, a, from a free Fourier perspective, a low frequency uh, set of signals, or from a subspace perspective, a low dimensional subspace, where that dimensionality of that subspace is much smaller than the number of samples, um, we can now think about what happens if you have like explicit sparsity. So here, we're gonna think about uh, same model as before, except I'm gonna change the parameter to be explicitly k-sparse. So now, uh, what we did was we looked at what happens for different solution strategies here, and there's these two different terms we're concerned about. You have the mean squared error that's gonna come from potentially overfitting the noise, and the mean squared error is gonna come from um, bleeding of the signal. So here, remember, is the picture from before. Um, we have the minimum two norm. You have the, the solution behaves bad. The reason it behaves badly is because the signal has bled away. There's, the minimum two norm doesn't suffer from overfitting of this noise. It ni nicely spreads the noise out over all of the uh, different features, giving us this n over d but unfortunately also spreads the signal out over all everybody, and that gives an over D. Now, we could fight this if we put a prior already on the appropriate 500 places or thereabouts, but the alternative thing we could do is we could do the natural thing we would want to do for a sparse linear model, which is look at something like a minimum one norm, something which is naturally sparsity seeking. So it turns out if you look at the minimum one norm uh, interpolating solution, so this is like the lasso, except with no, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't have, allow any squared errors, the interpolating solution. It turns out that you don't have this uh, signal bleed effect and you get this curve, this green curve here. So what's interesting is that there's a gap between this green curve and that converse bound that we talked about before. And it's interesting to think of why that happens. So if you just have a sparsity seeking uh, inference algorithm, like minimum one norm, what happens is that it basically picks a solution that's too sparse. Okay, what do I mean by too sparse? What I mean by too sparse is that it isn't able to get this N over D scaling that we talked about in this uh, lower bound. The noise energy doesn't get absorbed across all of the different features. And the reason is that minimum one norm is, has a name in signal processing. It's called basis pursuit. And that name comes from something very natural, that when you try to find the minimum one norm solution to, you know, if you have, uh, you know, 10,000 different uh, features, but only 5,000 different uh, training points, the minimum one norm solution will always, oops, uh, will always put uh, its support only on 5,000 features. It will never exceed the number of samples in terms of where it puts its support. And that prevents it from getting this noise absorption effect that you need to get the N over D scaling. So to get the N over, and so it, it suffers, it can't, it can't go all the way down. So it turns out you can construct schemes that basically are hybrids of these two approaches that do have a lot of behavior like the minimum one norm, but then allow a softening and allow the noise energy to be absorbed across more features. And you can get behavior that's kind of gets the best of both worlds. And so in our paper, we talk about how you can do this. And it's like really very, very simple. I want to show these as an existence proof. So these are like hacks um, in which what we do is we say, OK, how do we do this? We basically run an algorithm that's like minimum one norm, like lasso, but we don't let it interpolate all the way. And then we transition to a new behavior where we allow the rest of it to go like minimum two norm. And you can get this uh, mixed this uh, combination behavior. So this says 
for the sparse case, you can actually get, uh, you know, at pretty close to this uh, ideal curve. So any questions on this? Yeah, it's you one said D. something. Yeah, Sorry. you're on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so you said something that uh, I don't understand about the minimum now, uh, one norm. In fact, any solution in the span is feasible, right? So you said that if you have 5,000 examples and uh, uh, say 100,000 features, then the support is going to be 5,000. But in fact, anything in the null space can be a solution, right? Yeah, so let me, let me, let me, let me say that more, more precisely. Um, so um, when I have uh, uh, 100,000, use your example, I have 100,000 features and I have 5,000 training points. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of interpolating solutions. Most of those interpolating solutions are dense. They use everything. Um, if you ask, if you choose between them and you say, I will choose the minimum of all these interpolating solutions, I'll choose the one that has the minimum two norm, that minimum two norm solution will also be dense. It'll basically use all 100,000 features. It'll put some support on all of them. However, if I ask for the minimum one norm solution for 5,000 training points out of 100, using 100,000 features, it turns out that the minimum one norm solution will always pick roughly 5,000 uh, 5, features. It will put zero on the rest. Why is that? The reason is that you can view the minimum, minimum one norm solutions, you can reduce to basically an LP. And for LPs, you know that LPs will generically choose points in the, on the corners. The corners here turn out to be these sparse things. So that's a way of understanding why it is that minimum one norm uh, solutions will be sparse in the sense of only using 5,000 features, even though they have 100,000 to choose from. Well, I have done some uh, minimal IL-1 norm algorithms myself, but in that particular problem uh, setting, you don't have a vertex, a single vertex. You have a whole facet or a whole subspace. So there is the minimal L1 norm is oblivious to the L0 norm. What you're describing is actually that, you know, get the minimum L0 in, uh, among all the solutions in the sp subspace that minimize uh, um, the L2, uh, the regression problem. Oh, so, so and that's here, what I don't understand, oh, how you uh, actually eliminate that. Okay, so here, here what we're doing is we're asking for the interpolating solution. So there's a constraint. We want A, a theta equals Y. I understand that, but let's so, take it off one. But I, yeah, I, we can take it off one. I'm happy I to talk about it. I don't agree with your observation. Uh, and, and also with respect to Lars, it's a greedy algorithm. So what you're now, uh, you're entangling the algorithm with the properties of the solution, just as a comment. So, so yeah, so I was talking, I wasn't talking about the use of Lars uh, in particular here. I just meant that when you, so, we're making assumptions, of course. So we're making the assumption here of, you know, the features here are like behaving generically, like they're random Gaussian. So for this case, we can show this happens. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm happy to talk offline with about what's All right. happening. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, Daniel, you, you had a question as well, right? Yeah, but I'll, I'll leave it so you can keep going. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll skip this. And now I want to talk about the, you know, like what happens in classification. So we've done all this analysis in the regression case, but what happens in classification? So I'm going to talk about binary linear classification. So we all understand that binary linear classification is like regression, except you just have to get the sign right. So it's easier. And um, the question is, does this, how much does this easierness matter? And in what way does it matter? And you know, for this case, we can use things like support vector machines, logistic regression, and so on. You know, we're not going to necessarily look for interpolating solutions. So let's see what happens if we do this. Okay, so I'm going to first show you some pictures, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at, again, the simple Fourier-style view. I'm going to look at uh, the signal, the true, the, what's the true class? 
everything greater than zero is in the positive class. Everything less than zero is in the negative class. It, it's super simple. And I'm just going to ask a uh, logistic regression, an SVM, and a two-norm uh, interpolator to use Fourier features to predict this. Okay, so what happens? So here is the case. There's 32 data points, and I'm going to allow 51 of the Fourier features to be used. The blue is what the learned signal is. And what's interesting here is that between the SVM, the minimum L2, and logistic, they all learn something very, very similar, but not quite the same uh, in this case. But as I add more over-parameterization, add more Fourier features, let's see what happens. When I add, when I go to same 32 samples, and I go to 101 uh, Fourier features that are allowed. Every single one of these learns the identical solution, which is this blue one. So there's logistic, SVM, or just ask for the L2 interpolator of these you know, plus ones and minus ones, you get this. And uh, I mean, I just stopped drawing it for these points. I mean, these, it, it does the same thing for these points. Um, if I go to 1,001 features, um, same, uh, you know, same kind of set of points, you get this blue curve. They're all identical. They all behave uh, in this way. And uh, you get these interpolating solutions that are spikes that hit these points and then bleed away to near zero everywhere else. Sorry. So. And these are the minimum blah, blah, blah solutions. You're not training to find these. These are like the Oracle solutions. Oh, so in this case, I'm literally saying, here's my training data. And I will just run, uh, I, give this, I give it access to 51 Fourier features. And I say, you know, learn an SVM, learn minimum L2, learn logistic regression on these. But you are learning using gradient descent or something like this? Yeah, I mean, in this case, these are all convex, so I can, yeah. I can use gradient descent, I can use anything. It, they all find the same thing. And they're not obviously from their formulation, the exact same program. So there's something about uh, the way noise is being dissipated. So this is, this is clean. There's no noise of any kind. It's, it's literally the cleanest possible signal. Everything that's positive is positive. Everything that's negative is negative. Like there's two classes, positive class and negative class. And the features it has to work with are um, the sine of x, the cosine of x, sine 2x, cosine 2x, and so on. Okay, so, and when I say an SVM, I just can drop it into a, a, any SVM solver. Um, L2 is just, you know, use the, use the pseudo inverse to fit, and logistic regression is uh, run, for example, RLS. Or a gradient descent, doesn't matter if they all find the same thing. So, what's happening here is an interesting behavior is that everything becomes a support vector as I add more and more features. Um, and uh, if you just took a very naive view of the margin, which is just I look at my you know, norm of the weights, this is like a very, very naive view of margin. This is getting these points, these positive and negative points are getting further and further separated in this very naive view of margin. Um, but, you know, it's doing horribly. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's test uh, regression loss and classification losses, both are just degenerating very badly. Um, which is like, it's a crazy thing to ask for, but it's behaving badly. This is not any nice double descent of any kind just to illustrate what can happen. So there's a few interesting things here. Um, one is this idea that regardless of whether I'm doing SVMs or logistic regression, everything is becoming a support vector. Um, it's easiest to understand that actually, if you think about the relationship between logistic and SVM, maybe I'll come back to that. I want to make sure I, I get to my other main points. And so the question is, okay, so this is, a, this is a crazy setting. I'm telling it, you know, fit these points. There's only 32 of them. I'm giving it way too many features to work with. It's doing badly. Okay, fine. It does badly. Let's play with the prior. So 
I'm going to keep the same pictures from before. Uh, so it's going to be there's 20 features I'm going to favor. I'm going to adjust this prior strength. Um, and the first feature, for my plots, I'm going to show you the first feature is actually the true feature. The rest are just there, um, uh, just there uh, for to confuse the algorithm effectively um, with what's happening. And as I adjust the, the weight uh, to favor the earlier uh, features, I'm going to give any inference algorithms a better shot of getting it right. Now, here, before, if you remember, I talked about the regression error. The regression error is the 1 minus the survival squared plus the contamination squared. Because you know, these are, this is your actual signal. This is how much it's been reduced. And this is basically independent on test points squared. So it's a squared error. So this is what regression error is. How does classification behave? Classification, for classification to be true, it has to be that your, your survived thing is not overcome by the contamination. So you have to get the sign right, right? So the survival uh, has to be strong enough that the contamination can't flip the sign, okay? And it turns out that in this particular case, you get this nice expression of tan inverse of uh, survival over contamination. Um, for an ex explicit expression for what, how the classification error will behave in this case. But it tells you something interesting about what's happening in regression versus uh, classification. It reminds you of the story of the you know, two men who are running past the bear, right? Two men are, the bear is chasing two men. One man is smiling. The other man asks him, you know, hey, why are you smiling? Do you think you can outrun the bear? And the man says, no, I don't think I can outrun the bear, but I know I can outrun you, okay? So that's in classification, to get the sign right, you don't actually have to you know, get regression right. You just have to outrun the contamination that will try to flip your sign. So if you look at this and you play with this prior, you can see uh, as I sweep the strength of the early features over the later features, this is the weight on the preferred features, weight on the other features, as I give more and more weight to the preferred features, and if the true signal is a preferred feature, its survival is getting bigger and bigger. And the contamination that it's giving rise to through this uh, you know, two-norm minimization algorithm is getting smaller and smaller. And so what happens is we can just look at a picture of how does regression performance behave as I increase the weight on the true features and how does classification behave? And what's interesting is this curve. And so I can try to illustrate this curve for you, that when you give a lot of uh, strength to the prior, then both classification and regression do fine. So this is like a lot of weight. You recover the true coefficients. There's very little false discovery. And you get the pattern exactly. If you give too little weight to the true features, then Regression is behaving badly. That's what you can see here. And classification is also behaving badly. You can see lots of zero crossings here. And what's happening is you have too much false discovered stuff. You have too much contamination. And this is behaving badly. But there's also this interesting middle regime. Okay? In this middle regime, what's happening is regression is doing quite badly you're not actually getting the true signal correctly. You are false discovering lots of stuff, but it's not enough to cause trouble for classification on average. So this is this interesting new thing that happens for classification that this survival contamination perspective lets you discover. So it turns out that you can then, you know, once you, once you see this phenomenon, you can you know, construct an example. So here's an example that we have in our, uh, to, to show up on archive papers soon, um, where you can adjust the scaling. You can pick n as number of samples, increase the features with the number of samples, keep the prioritized features also you know, growing with the number of samples, but it's like that effective rank condition. You know, it's less than n. And you can also increase the strength of the filter in an appropriate way, and then, you can get the classification error will go to zero while the regression error will go to one. 
So these, these kind of intermediate regimes actually exist for classification, which is really interesting. So um, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I want to make sure I can get questions and also just hit maybe a couple of you know, teaser loose ends. Um, so uh, one is, so here I've talked about you know, classification and regression um, in an average expected sense. So the question is, what about adversarial examples? This one loose end, does this, does this story of contamination and survival help us understand something about where adversarial examples are coming from in this simple case? And I use this naive margin, does a more normalized sense of margin help us understand what's happening or does it not help? So just a couple of these loose ends. You know, the same thing, remember I'm sweeping through the priority, uh, these priority levels of how much I'm preferring the uh, lower frequency features. So in this intermediate regime, something interesting can happen is that, you know, you have contamination. Uh, on average, it's small, but these are like independent draws, right? So if you can search in a neighborhood of a test point, you can get different draws of this contamination, which is after all a higher frequency thing. And that gives rise to adversarial examples that can exist even where classification is working fine. Um, and we can predict their existence at, this, at these places. And the fact that in this regime where you have a lot of signal bleed and contamination, but classification can still work, uh, you know, this can happen. Finally, last thing I want to mention uh, is, you know, I was part of, part of a very naive margin. Um, there's this you know, great paper that talks about, you know, should really be normalizing your margins. And so in this particular case, we can, do this kind of normalization for the margin and see you know, what happens here. Um, I'm running out of time, so uh, I'll just go to the plots. So here's an example where I'm basically, on this side, I'm increasing the weight on the lower features, and this is like less weight on the lower features. And so the loss for regression and classification is getting um, better as I give more and more weight to the uh, lower free features. But this normalized margin is actually dropping. So despite the fact that the classification loss is actually getting better and better as I change this prioritization, the, even the normalized margin looks like it's going down. So the margin doesn't fully explain what's happening here is the comment I wanted to make. Um, same thing happens in the Wiggly case. Um, with that, I'll just stop at conclusions. I could say more. I, there was a question about, that was asked that I promised I'd get back to later, which was about, you know, does this interpolation picture have anything to do with anything? Like, should, why should we be trying to interpolate at all? Um, if there's still a question on that, I'll come back to it, but I wasn't one of the people ask a question because I am out of time. <laughs>